Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Dan Griswold. Dan is a Mercatus Center Senior Research Fellow and co-director of the Program on the American Economy and Globalization. He is a nationally recognized expert on trade and immigration policy. He previously served as president of the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones, representing its members in Washington before Congress and regulatory agencies. Prior to that, Dan was the director of trade and immigration studies for the Cato Institute. Dan is also the author of the 2009 book, Mad About Trade, Why Main Street America Should Embrace Globalization. Dan has testified before congressional committees, commented for TV, radio, authored numerous studies and articles, and addressed businesses and trade groups across the country about trade. Today, Dan joins us to talk about the basics of trade, trade deficits, and what it means for us today. Dan, welcome to the show. David, glad to be with you. Oh, it's a treat to have you on. So tell me, how did you get into economics and especially into trade policy? Yeah, my my original, uh, my first career was in journalism. I majored in journalism at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, my dad was in the weekly newspaper business. And I sort of caught the bug huh. there writing sports stories when I was in high school, and I, I sort of liked seeing my name in print and <laughs> getting comments from people. I was also pretty good with numbers. Uh, I liked calculus. In my senior or my uh, freshman year in college, I was actually a pre-engineering student, but just found I enjoyed journalism and writing and, and public affairs. I uh, worked for a couple of years uh, as a press secretary on, on Capitol Hill in the early 80s. That was an exciting time. And then my big career break in journalism was being a daily newspaper editorial page editor out in Colorado Springs for a newspaper chain. By then, I'd realized I was uh, very much in favor of a free market and limited government. Uh, Reagan came in. I'd saw I'd seen the failures of uh, the Carter administration and sort of liberal big government and mm-hmm. uh, Agreed with a lot of what Reagan uh, had to say about economics and, and other matters. So uh, for 12 years, I had the, the pleasure of writing uh, libertarian free market editorials uh, for a daily newspaper back when uh, that was a robust business. Uh, that's changed, of course, in the last 20 years. But uh, in the early 90s, you know, we had a big debate in this country over NAFTA. And I was writing editorials uh, about local subjects, but also about national and international subjects. And I was writing about NAFTA. And, of course, uh, I was inclined to support free trade uh, for lots of reasons. Um, But, you know, there were some more sophisticated arguments. uh, And uh, I heard people like Ross Perot criticizing, and I I knew they were wrong, but I wasn't quite sure exactly all the reasons why. I thought, you know, this economic stuff is really interesting. And I got the idea in my mid-30s, a wife and three kids, why don't I go back to graduate school and study economics? Really? Wow. Uh, My wife is British, uh, and so we decided if I'm going to take a couple of years off, let's go to England. Uh, I got accepted at the London School of Economics, Uh, spent two years there studying, uh, got a diploma in economics my first year, and a, uh, a master's in the politics of the world economy. Um, from LSE. And of course, over in Britain, they have this concept of political economy. You know, here we, uh, uh, we're more siloed academically. You have mm-hmm. the economists that have these elaborate mathematical models. And you have the international relations people who are talking about uh, uh, governments get along. And, um, and the two don't meet. Well, over there, you talk about them together. And economics happens in an institutional framework. And I realized if I just stuck with economics, I wouldn't be talking about Adam Smith and the WTO and all these institutions while LSE had this program. It's called the Politics of the World Economy, uh, International Political Economy. It was just what I needed to study. Um, And as I was finishing my final exams, uh, I got hired by the Cato Institute to be their director of trade and immigration studies. Uh, Spent a wonderful uh, 14 years there. I uh, had my four and a half years at the Trade Association where I learned a lot about how trade works on a port level, um, on a regulatory level, day, day to day. And then uh, here at Mercatus, uh, when they were talking about starting a, a program on uh, international trade and globalization, uh, I thought this is a great opportunity, especially uh, 
uh, with some of the ill winds blowing during the 2016 campaign. Not just Donald Trump, right, but Bernie Sanders and uh, Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton turning against TPP. It just all came together. Well, this has been a busy time for you um, since the election. In fact, it might even be a little discouraging, possibly. Some of the rhetoric coming out of the White House, we'll talk about some of that later. I joked with you earlier, though, that President Trump is the full employment act for you because (laughs) he's going to guarantee you much work, given some of the things he says about trade. So let's talk about an issue that he brings up that may be confusing to some of our listeners. Many of our listeners already understand this, but let's talk about trade deficits. What is a trade deficit? What has its history been in the U.S., and why is Trump so worked up about it? Yeah, and the trade deficit has been a source of misunderstanding for centuries. You know, Adam Smith took on the trade deficit. He called it this absurd doctrine of the balance of trade. And it really goes back to to mercantilism, right, which was the dominant trade uh, worldview back in the 1600s into the 1700s. And that is uh, we need to export as much as we can and import as little as possible because the whole idea of trade is to build up your your storehouse of gold, right? Mm -hmm. So you could wage war and win. Um, Adam Smith showed that that's just absurd. The the wealth of nations is not measured by their gold stockpiles. It's measured by how much stuff their people can enjoy and consume in their daily lives, services, uh, goods. Well, uh, I think Adam Smith delivered an intellectual knockout blow, but politically, it still resurfaces. And our politicians t- to this day have this view that trade is all about exporting. We win when we export. We grudgingly accept uh, imports. And then by that worldview, the trade deficit becomes a kind of scorecard of our success, right? And if we're buying $500 billion or more, or, or more from the rest of the world in goods and services every year than we sell, something must be wrong. Uh, and this is where Trump comes in. Uh, naturally, he's disposed that way. He sees trade as a zero-sum game where we win at somebody else's expense or vice versa. He's got advisors like uh, Peter Navarro uh, and others who see the world this way. So I have tried to weigh in both on an academic way, but also, you know, burden of my career having my journalism background. I'd like to take the sound economics and express them in a Main Street kind of way and help people understand that uh, the trade deficit is is not a problem. It's not what the politicians say. Um, imports are good. They make our lives better every day. They're important to our production because of globalized supply chains. And also, foreigners don't take those $500 billion and put them in cookie jars. They, they spend them in the U.S. economy. It's just that they come back to buy our assets, right? Treasury bonds, uh, real estate, uh, foreign direct investment, and another way of saying that is that's an investment surplus, and we benefit from that as well. Yes. Now, Trump did get elected based in large part, I think, on economic angst and uncertainty. And and in times like those, it's easy to point a finger at things that seem to be bad, immigrants, yes. trade deficits. Yes. So I want to do go, go briefly with you, maybe to a very fundamental level, and just talk about trade. You have a great paper that we'll get to in a minute, but before we do that, Let's just talk about trade. Is trade natural? Do people naturally trade? Do you have to teach someone to trade? Or if you do, you know, if you had a plane that crashed and they all landed on the island, <laughs> would trade labor specialization naturally emerge? Uh, David, that's an interesting way to put it. And I'd say, yes, trade is natural. You know, again, Adam Smith said something about our natural propensity to truck and barter mm-hmm. and, and trade. And yeah, your, your example of people being on an island is actually a pretty good starting place. Uh, Robinson Crusoe, mm-hmm. uh, he was a self-contained economy. He didn't have to compete against any sort of imported goods. He was very poor. You think of a, a, a small village up at the end of a, a, a hollow in the, the Appalachians. They're very poor because they can't specialize as much. If each state had to have its own automobile industry and its own agriculture and was self-sufficient, think how poor the states would be. And one of the reasons the United States has been so fantastically successful is we basically have a continental free trade area, don't we? Their constitution guarantees free trade among the states. We don't think anything of it. Well, free trade is just taking that 
sound principle of people being able to specialize and do what they do best and trade with others, and it takes it to a, a global level. Nations like states, like people, are better off if they can specialize in what they do best and trade with other countries. Yes, you know, it's, it is interesting. You, you mentioned like poor people who have a lack of trade. I think one of the defining characteristics of a developing economy is that people there, poor people in those countries, often attempt to do everything. So someone in a poor village in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa may make their own clothes, their own tools, build their own huts, yes. grow their own food, where a, a characteristic of a typical person in, in, say, Europe or the U.S. is they have a job and they outsource their food production, their car production, and it, and that's you know it's it's sometimes we take that for granted, but if we sit back and realize you know what's going on here in in the developing countries is they're attempting you know this saying, uh, jack of all trades, master of nothing, yes. right? And so you, you, you if you if you don't specialize in one thing, you never really get good at it, and you can't yes. be productive. And and I, I it's, again I think it's something natural. I, might, I think we both agree on this. And you mentioned Adam Smith. You know Adam Smith when he wrote the Wealth of Nations, he wasn't being so much pres prescriptive as observing what he saw. Why yes. are countries getting rich, right? Yes. He saw this labor specialization and contrast that with like Karl Marx. Much more, this is what we should do. This is the problems I see right. what we should do. So I think it's an important point that you know, trade is natural. You don't have to tell a child what you get from trade. You know, my kids, they want to trade baseball cards. They want to make themselves better off. And it goes through adulthood. So the, the question is, I guess, can we scale up? And, and you've said that we can. I want to get more into this. Can we scale up? What are the, the costs, the, the advantage of scaling up from a, an individual to a state level to a country level? And let's begin by thinking about what trade is in a more systematic manner. And you have a great paper, a recent paper on this, and the paper yes. is titled Plumbing America's Balance of Trade. And we'll make links to this available on our website. A recent publication by Daniel Griswold. So, Daniel, tell us about this paper and how it helps us understand trade better. Yeah, and the the the, the title is a kind of play on words because uh, plumbing. We're we're examining it. We're plumbing the depths of America's balance of trade. But also, I use the metaphor in there of our our trade relations with the rest of the world being a kind of waterworks, and that is uh, above ground. We're trading the goods and services and titles to assets. But of course, as you well know. There's a dollar flow uh, going on un underneath. And what I, I try to do a couple of things in the paper, big things in the paper. One is help Americans understand uh, that our relations with the rest of the world are, are, are complex, interrelated. It isn't just trade in goods, as important as that is, but it's trade in services, it's investment income, and it's investment flows, trading in assets. And... Uh, our international accounting with the rest of the world is kind of like your basic accounting in a business. It's, it's double entry bookkeeping, debits and credits. So uh, if money flows out to buy an import, that money comes back to the United States. They, you know, they call it trade for a reason. People don't give us cool stuff like cars and big screen TVs and not expect something in return. Either something cool from us, like a ton of soybeans or a jet engine, or they'll accept willingly an asset, a treasury bond, a stake in a factory in the United States, a stock in the U.S. stock market. And lo and behold, David, uh, about $4 trillion flows out of the United States every year into the global exchange market, and $4 trillion flows back. Hmm. Uh, it gets balanced. And, of course, the, the transmission belt here is the exchange rate, right? If... Uh, demand for U.S. assets goes up in the world. Oh, say the economy's picking up and people say, I want a piece of, of America or they want to invest. There's global uncertainty and they want to buy treasury bonds. They, they can only do that with dollars. So demand for dollars goes up. Uh, and, and so if money's going into assets, the value of the dollar goes up. Of course, that makes our exports a little more expensive, imports less so. And so the trade deficit widens. That's why the trade deficit tends to widen when times are good, U.S. consumers are flush, they're feeling confident, and also the world wants to, the world always wants to buy our exports. They're very popular. The world loves to buy our assets because we're such a big, open, liquid capital market in the world. So you mentioned the, the, 
we've been talking about, and you mentioned the trade deficit, which we maybe we could say more generally a trade balance because we could have a trade surplus. Some countries do have trade surpluses. Yes. So within that trade balance, you also alluded to there's, it, it can be broken down into other categories. In yes. particular, there can be a goods balance and a yes. service balance. So the goods balance are the physical things we trade. Yeah, we call that a merchandise balance. Merchandise that would balance. Be, you know, things you could drop on your foot. So soybeans, steel, computer chips. And okay. then there's services, which some people call invisible trade. Uh, and that's things like financial services and consulting uh, and architecture, that sort of thing. Travel. Okay. You know, when, when you go on a European vacation, in effect, you're importing a service, right? You're spending dollars to buy it. You have to, you have to go over there to pick it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but you're, that's a service uh, import when we travel abroad. When a group of Chinese tourists comes here to view the Grand Canyon, that's a service export for the United States. And by the way, we run a, we run a, a pretty large deficit on, on the merchandise side, $700 billion or more. We run a $200 billion or more surplus on uh, services. We're very competitive in that. That's been growing. And it's interesting, we run a pretty large surplus on investment income, you know, interest and profits and dividends earned on assets owned abroad or in the United States. So, so the service part of that trade balance is interesting and maybe a little bit you know, puzzling for some of our listeners. Just one more example. So something that I'm real familiar with being a former professor, we have foreign students who come in. Mm -hmm. So where I was, we had a number of students from Saudi Arabia. For whatever reasons, not a lot of Saudi Arabian students in my former university. So how would that be recorded from the U.S. perspective? Right. That would be a service export. Okay. Uh, on, on several levels, uh, if they travel here on a U.S. airline, mm -hmm. uh, they're spending dollars uh, on a U.S. service, and then on their, their tuition. In effect, we're, we're exporting uh, educational uh, services. They, again, they, like you going to Europe, they have to come here to, p to pick it up. Uh, and, and so that we're very competitive uh, in that. And the point uh, of in the paper of me talking at some length about this elaborate system is that it's interrelated. If, if our politicians turn off the spigot of dollars flowing ab abroad to buy uh, clothes and shoes and electronics from China, that just means fewer dollars out there in global exchange markets. And those students will find it harder to get dollars to spend to come to the United States and maybe the dollar will get so strong they'll decide to go to Canada or Australia and we'll, we'll lose in other parts and we'll be a less efficient competitive economy in, in other areas. Yeah, so your, your plumbing analogy reminds me of like a water park, right? You see the rides, the actual action above ground, but below ground there's all this water flowing that um, you know, is very important. The park that we see cannot function yes. without the plumbing beneath moving water back and forth. Correct. And uh, and also you know that the education thing, of course, is near and dear to my heart, as I mentioned. So what you're saying is when I gave my invigorating lecture to these students from Saudi Arabia, um, I was helping the U.S. export a service. Right. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, that's where we seem to have done the best. We export, we have a, we, we export more services than we import, so we run a, a surplus in that category. But on goods, we run a deficit. We import more goods than we export. Right. Now, you also went on, so we, that's the trade balance. And you, I would say that's okay, by the way. Oh, that's uh, okay, right. Now, now, you went on to also mention another category. So we have the trade balance, and you mentioned all the investment income. Yes. Um, so if we have assets overseas that can earn us income and vice versa, foreigners in the U.S., and we're, what you said is we're earning more investment income net. So my, more income's coming in on investment than is going out. Is that right? Yeah, and this is maybe one of the more counterintuitive findings of, of the paper. Foreigners own more assets in the United States than Americans own abroad. They, earn, they own about $29 trillion of U.S. assets. We own about $23 trillion of assets abroad. And, and of course, that's what you'd expect when you know, year after year, we're running a, a deficit on the current account, which is all our trade kind of put together, uh, and a surplus of, of investment capital coming into the country, which is just foreigners acquiring 500 
billion dollars more in U.S. assets in a year than we uh, acquire abroad. The interesting thing is we still earn more on our investments abroad. Why? Because we get a higher rate of return. Um, U.S. outward investment tends to be focused in direct investment. So think of a U.S. multinational establishing an affiliate abroad to provide goods and services. Foreign investment in the United States tends to be more on the portfolio side, uh, some in the stock market, but mostly treasury bonds, right? You know as well as I do, foreigners love U.S. treasury bonds. They yeah. own, I don't know, $5 trillion worth. Uh, the Chinese and the Japanese alone earn about own about a trillion dollars of uh, treasury bonds. But as you also, you and Scott well know, they don't pay a real high interest rate on that. So foreigners are looking for security and stability, right? Uh, safety of their principal. U.S. companies are out there looking for higher returns. So year after year, we're earning uh, about $200 billion or more, more per year in our investments abroad than foreigners are earning in the United States. And that offsets, that helps to offset uh, the goods balance. That's one more reason why we shouldn't be obsessed with the good balance, e goods balance, even though I don't think that's a problem. Okay, just to go back and, and to summarize it, to f define and summarize the term you use, you use the term current account balance. Yes. And that term is a broader, the complete measure of all the international transactions we do. A little narrower than that. So okay. the, the current account is the uh, trade in goods and services, broadly defined, uh, kind of day-to-day -day transactions uh, for goods and services. And of course, that includes, you know, when you earn interest on something, in, a, in, a, in effect, the owner of the assets uh, paying uh, a return on that uh, to, to, to rent it, a treasury bond, right? So that's a kind of service. And then we have another category called unilateral transfers, you know, foreign aid, remittances, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's a kind of trade, even though they don't expect something tangible in return. So that's the current account side. The other side of the ledger is uh, there's a couple of names for it, but broadly the financial account. Okay. So think of that as trade in titles to assets, treasury bonds, property, yeah. stock. Uh, and that's different, of course, right? You, you buy something to hold it and then resell it later on, whereas you don't buy, generally buy a ton of soybeans or steel to hold onto it and resell it. You consume it or, or you use it in your production process. And lo and behold, those two, the, the current account deficit that we have in America is pretty much exactly offset by the financial, and there's a smaller part called the capital account surplus that we have. Uh, the bean counters can't get it exactly right, so we have something called uh, uh, errors and omissions or the statistical discrepancy. But over time, that's no more than about 1%, one, 1.5% one of the overall accounts. Uh, it's just that they can't keep track of all the services and everything. And I, actually, I'm glad they can't keep track of everything, right? <laughs> well, so, so just to put this differently, the current account balance is one side of the balance of payments. And, right. then, and it, it captures, again, the, the trade balance, um, interest income, and then any kind right. of, uh, you said, unilateral, unilateral transfers. Like you give a, a gift overseas charity. Yes. And then the flip, so, so that all those summed together should be the opposite of, whatever is happening in terms of asset transactions, a treasury, stocks, going overseas, so Co forth. Correct. And, and that financial inflow, you know, <clears throat> it's kind of hard uh, on, a, on a podcast to get into the national income accounts identity, <laughs> yeah. right? Y equals right, right. Uh, all that. But in a nutshell, that inflow of foreign capital comes into the United States because our domestic savings fall short of investment, right? We have a certain level of national investment, which I think is something like 22% of GDP. We have uh, our, our level of savings, which is somewhat below that. Mm -hmm. uh, that gap is filled by foreign savings coming in. And another way, uh, another key uh, point of the paper, and of course this isn't original to me, economists have been talking about this for, for decades, but our tri the current account deficit is defined by that domestic level of savings and investment doesn't have anything to do with trade policy, unfair trade practices abroad, lack of competitiveness. It's those macroeconomic domestic levels of savings and investment. In other words, if you want to fix the trade deficit, and I don't think it needs to be fixed, if you want to change it, you've got to somehow change the domestic level of savings and investment. 
getting tough with our trading partners, raising trade barriers, uh, spending more on the Exim Bank, none of that's going to change, fundamentally change our balance of trade. You've got to somehow change the domestic levels of savings and investment. I want to do one more example to flesh out this idea, and we'll move on. To, to illustrate the idea of the, you know, the current account versus the financial account. So if I buy an automobile from Japan, yes, my Honda Odyssey minivan that I actually do own. I have my, one too. They're okay. great, aren't they? <laughs> Us older men here with children, yes. kids, and families, date ourselves. All right, so I, I, I buy that from Japan. And what Japan now is looking for is, is something in return. I don't have the real resources to give them anything. So what I give them instead is I sell them an IOU. I sell them a treasury. I, maybe I sell them part of my ownership of my company. I sell them something. And those two transactions have to completely offset each other? Yeah, yes, they do. And by definition. So, so what would happen? Let, that's a great example. You buy your Honda Odyssey for $20,000. The Japanese can't pay. Let's say it's made in Japan. The Japanese can't pay their workers with U.S. dollars. They want yen, right? So that company will pr either take those dollars and just exchange them to somebody else who wants the dollars to buy something, or they may, uh, yes, they may put it in a U.S. bank. Uh, they may buy a treasury bond. They may invest it in some other facility, some Honda factory in the United States that's making some other car. The point is uh, it comes back to the United States. Uh, to buy something. People acquire dollars abroad because they want to buy something in the U.S. economy, either one of our assets or a good and service uh, for export. All right, so the question becomes the causality of that relationship, right? So is it my buying the Honda Odyssey van that triggers a reaction? Well, they got to have something, you know, to make up for the for the van, so they go after my bond, or is it the other way around? Um, Japan has a high savings rate. They're looking for a nice, safe asset. They see the U.S. Oh, look at that great treasury bond over. Let's go grab the treasury bond. But by getting a treasury bond, their, their money's flowing into the U.S. Then David Beck, with a consumer, takes that and buys something. So which which way does the yeah. causality go? Uh, it it is complicated, and that's the okay. wonder of the free market <laughs> and price mechanism, right? And and all that. No one can predict it. I would say it's capital flows probably tend to drive the exchange rate more than goods and services. Even though, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a I have a uh, table in the paper that shows how much is flowing in and out, and I talk in some detail about how the money's spent. It looks like spending on goods dominates, right? More than half of that four trillion dollars uh, that flows out and in is is related to goods. That's a little misleading in that, you know. With assets, you can buy and sell them multiple times within a period, right? Um, the Treasury Department's figured that in a given year, the back and forth trading of Treasury instruments internationally is something like $27 trillion. Hmm. So uh, the inflow and outflow of investment dollars uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is much higher than for goods. So I tend to think the capital account somewhat drives the foreign exchange, or it drives the current account and goods and services trade. And of course, the, the key price signal there is the exchange rate. So again, if, if foreigners want those treasury bills, they want to invest in America, uh, that's one reason why you, you've seen the dollar jump up uh, under President Trump. There's, a, there's some hope there, some animal spirits, right, that the U.S. economy is going to go faster. People want a piece of that the dollar's going up. The irony, of course, David, is this president who's uh, pretty much made it a promise he's going to shrink the trade <laughs> deficit. His economic policies, if, if they work, if they mm -hmm. ramp up our growth rate, if, he, if the government, federal government starts spending money on infrastructure and the federal deficit gets bigger and national savings goes down, if investment goes up and savings goes down, what happens to the trade deficit and the dollar? The dollar gets stronger. The trade deficit expands. Yeah, so the irony of the Trump policies is that he's fighting against himself. <laughs> he's, he, he doesn't realize one hand's pushing one direction, the other hand's pushing against him himself. That is so. one of several ironies in the <laughs> yes. Trump economic and trade. Right. So plans. going back to this idea that the trade flows have to be offset by the asset flows. So one of the big discussions that we had leading into 
the housing crisis, even since then, 2008, is, is this question of did the housing boom create you know, a need for us to go borrow from somewhere? Or as Ben Bernanke argued, there was a saving glut, that there was all this excess savings around the world and it, and it needed a place to find, it needed a home, right? So in Asia and China, they'd save, at some point, they saved like 50% of GDP with domestic savings. So, so it, it, it goes looking for a home. The U.S. is a great place to park your savings, yeah. save, maybe higher returns um, on a risk-adjusted basis. And so they, they parked their, their funds in the U.S., and, and those funds found their way into mortgage-backed securities, and ultimately into housing. So you know, there's this question, again, of causality. Did the foreigners' funds flowing into the U.S. help kind of kickstart that housing boom? Or did the housing boom kind of generate a need to borrow from abroad? Yeah, you're, you're leading me out into deeper waters, David. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to leave it to you and Scott to, okay. to you know dissect the, the housing crisis and all that. I, I, I will say this. I, I think there's an interplay of the two. I think Ben Bernanke... Uh, was onto something when he talked mm-hmm. about a global savings glut. Uh, I would agree with him to this in the sense that while in the U.S. we have I- investment exceeding our level of savings, and the, the foreign savings come in to fill that gap, as you point out, in a lot of other countries, Japan being chief among them, Germany another one, their national savings exceeds their domestic investment, and so yes, their their savings go in search of investment opportunities, and of course, the United States is we're pretty good at providing investment opportunities, either very secure treasury bonds or direct investment uh, in in the U.S. So you did see that interplay. Uh, The IMF has calculated that foreign investment in the United States, particularly treasury bonds, has kept long-term interest rates down almost a full point, like 80 basis points. I, I don't think you can blame that for the housing crisis. That just made interest rates lower. It's sort of the, the market's quantitative easing. Yeah, it, yeah. Didn't, it didn't uh, favor subprime loans or anything like that. The banks still uh, have to exercise due diligence. But just in a general way, access to foreign capital makes investment uh, more um, <clears throat> affordable and realizable here in the United States. Think of it this way. If those foreign savings couldn't come into the United States, the federal government when it's running a half a trillion dollars or a trillion dollar deficit, they'd have to finance that with domestic savings. They'd they'd crowd out. Remember that term we used to hear? We don't hear it too much anymore because foreign investment comes in and there isn't crowding out. We would have had crowding out of investment, both in housing and in uh, companies and all the other ways we invest our dollars. Yeah, I think a great way to think about that is if you go back to the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life, Mm-hmm. 1930s depression and the main character gets up the, of course there's a bank run going on it's a savings and loan but there's a bank yes. run going on and he gets up on the counter and, and tells everybody hey your savings is in this person's house and your savings is in that person's house and so effectively the the available credit for a mortgage in the 1930s was your local community yes. people saving in your community by opening the global capital markets not only is my neighbor potentially funding my mortgage, but some person in China is funding my mortgage. So there's a bigger pool of funds to draw yes. from, which makes it better for me. Um, going back to what you mentioned, but it also means you know interest rates were a little bit lower on our mortgages because there's easy, more credit available. And then you're right, that's just one small part of the story of why we had a housing boom. So I don't want to overstate that, but it's, it's an interesting discussion. But along those lines, I, I, like, I like that you know, I, I am pushing you to the deep end because there, there's a narrative that I like. This is my own bias, my own view. And that is, I, I like to view the U.S. as a banker to the world. And you've, you've alluded to this already. But if you look at our balance sheet relative to the rest of the world, what we owe to the world, what the world owes to us, our balance sheet for the U.S. as a whole looks like that of a bank. Mm-hmm. Like, as you mentioned, you know, foreigners, a disproportion of what they will want, their money comes in, what they want to buy from us are these safe assets, treasury bonds, commercial paper, highly liquid. They buy some other riskier stuff, but mostly it's the safe stuff, the stuff you want to hold on to and quickly turn into purchasing power. And then we take our funds that we send overseas and invest them, as you said, in in, in higher yielding, higher returning foreign invest factories, stocks, riskier stuff, but higher if they pay better. So if you take the difference between what we have to pay foreigners for treasuries, very little, and what we earn, this great amount of money that's coming in, we look a lot like a bank 
And you know the thing about a bank, look at your local bank, it does the same thing. It, it takes in the, uh, deposits, pays very little or nothing on them, lends out in, in terms like of a mortgage, earns a spread. It, it effectively is taking in more money than it's paying out. Same thing we do, but we don't look at banks and say, ah, oh, evil bank, you're running a current account deficit with your community. Right. Right. So it, it's how it's used, what's the motivation, what's the mechanisms behind it. Yeah, I think that's that's a good a good analogy. And yes, our treasury market is a large part of the assets that we uh, we offer to the world. Uh, the world does invest here in our companies. You know, I point out in the paper that uh, 6.4 million Americans work for foreign owned comp- foreign owned affiliates in the United States. So, you know, David, maybe one way to summarize it is. Um, the U.S. is competitive in a broad range of industrial and service industries. We, we have a comparative advantage, and we sell $2 trillion plus of stuff to the rest of the world. We also have a comparative advantage in investment opportunities, and that's what I think a lot of people may say, oh, America's not competitive anymore. We don't make anything anymore. It's not right. That's, that's uh, dead, dead wrong. We make lots of cool stuff, and we sell, sell it around the world. But we're pretty good at also creating investment opportunities. And no, we're not selling the household China. This uh, uh, Trump's trade advisor, Peter Navarro, was trying to make this point the other day, quoting Warren Buffett, that uh, conquest by purchase. You know, yes, we have an inflow of foreign investment, but they're buying up all our assets and we'll be left with no assets. That's ridiculous. Uh, yes, foreign assets owned in the United States have gone up to $29 trillion, as I mentioned. What's happened to net household worth in the United States? It's at record highs. If you take household, nonprofit, and business net worth, it's over $100 trillion. Hmm. So we can create assets the same way we create goods and services. And we're wealthier. Foreign investors in the United States are wealthier. I call that a, a win-win for trade. Oh, I like that. And and, and I, I like to throw this out there. This is a joke that was often thrown around the, early to mid 2000s when people were worried about a trade deficit. In fact, interestingly enough, you know, the, the crisis that was predicted before the housing bust was we're going to have a dollar crisis because they're running these huge current account deficits. Yes. Never happened. That scenario never seems and never, to happen. And, and I think it's because they failed to, many of these critics and observers failed to appreciate this banker to the world role that we play. We provide these great investment opportunities. But another way of saying this, a little more crudely and in and and, and a way that might make some people uncomfortable is that one of our advantages, one of our comparative advantages, one of our strengths is we know how to export good debt, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have a comparative advantage in exporting debt to the world. And you're like, oh, that sounds horrible. But, but think, if you're someone who's saving for retirement, if you have some long-term project, you want to park your funds somewhere safe, right? Right. And we have the deep capital markets. We've got the rule of law. We have history. We have just a financial sector that's sophisticated, we truly have a comparative advantage in exporting debt to the world. And that usually you, you shudder in horror when you hear that, but, but we got to recognize that fact. Yeah, and, and uh, we're so good at it, we can pay next to nothing uh, <laughs> for people to park their savings here. Yeah, no, I agree with that. There is the misunderstanding that we're a, a debtor nation, right? That phrase uh, came in, was, was being used a lot in, in past years. And I would say, well, yes, our federal government owes a lot of debt, and hopefully they'll start to pay that off. But that's a fiscal issue. That's not a trade issue. But you have to remember, a, a lot of that incoming investment here isn't debt. It's, it's in equities. It's mm-hmm. in uh, direct investment, factories, real estate. And that isn't debt of, of any sort, is it? You know, the, equity, yeah. There's a, a Nissan factory in Nashville, Tennessee, where a couple of my kids uh, uh, live live. That, that isn't a debt we owe to Japan. That's an investment that Japanese company has made here in the United States in our productive capacity that makes us more productive as a nation. But even on the, the debt side, right? let's go to the most uncomfortable part of this. If the world is saying, hey, we want your debt, <laughs> we need, because our country we don't trust, I mean, we're, we're providing a valuable service to the world. And, and, and I, I do think it, it makes the life of a politician easier, makes it easier for Congress 
and, and the president to not worry as much about budget deficits and stuff like that because rates are so low. But, it, but I, I also think it, it means our debt capacity is higher than it would otherwise be. Now, whether this can go on forever is another question. But let's, let's move on to a, something else that's come up with this discussion, part of the Trump administration. And, and this idea that the trade deficit is bad because of an accounting identity. So we, we've, we've talked about why trade deficits in themselves aren't necessarily bad, but there's this idea that, you know, um, trade def- more trade deficits means less economic growth. Can you explain this this idea? And Peter Navarro is the one who's been advocating yeah, it recently. Yeah, and again, you know, just picture in your mind, it's a standard equation, Y, which is GDP equals uh, private sector consumption, government consumption, investment, and uh, net exports, export minus imports. Well, of course, I think the right way to look at that is uh, GDP depends on the factors of production, right? Labor, capital, total factor, productivity. And then the right side of the equation is just what we do with it. You know, we, we make 100 widgets. There's only four things we can do with it, right? We can consume it uh, individually. We can consume it as the government. We can invest it or we can export it. What uh, Peter Navarro and other people, actually this is a very common misunderstanding, they look at it as a, they look at the right side of the equation and say, well, you add up all these things and you get our GDP. And you see that in the reporting on the GDP reports. And I have to say the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the department in the Commerce Department that calculates GDP, they contribute to this because they say, uh, you know, in net exports, you have exports minus imports, that's our trade balance. Exports, of course, are a minus, or sorry, imports are a minus. And so in a simplistic way, the more we import, GDP must be lower because that's stuff we don't make. Well, the problem with that is the government actually calculates GDP not by counting up what we produce, but by counting what we consume and then assuming that if we consume it, we had to produce it. Well, the problem is imports are baked into the other, those other categories, those other terms So the government just knows we consumed $16 trillion last year, uh, but they don't know how much of that is imports and how much is domestically produced. Same with what the government does, same with investment, same with what we export. You know, our exports have a certain import uh, component. So they subtract out imports at the end of that so we don't double count them in the other factors. So they're neutral on the growth equation. But Peter Navarro, there's some debate, does he... Does he know he's making a mistake uh, and is just doing it for political purposes or does he really believe what he says? I, I don't know. But he, he exploits this to make uh, imports and the trade deficit look like it's a drag on growth when in fact it's, it's not. And I think that's an important point because Peter Navarro has made this a big deal and there's been some people who've written about why he's terribly confused about this. But you will often see even like in newspaper stories – you know, GDP this quarter was 3%. It was dragged down by a 2.2% increase in, in, in imports. Yes. And, and but So you often will see people talking about this accounting identity and talk about how our imports were a drag on growth. I mean, I've seen that many times. But really, all it is is, is a way to avoid double counting. C- correct. We're and, just subtracting them out because they were originally right. added in in these other terms. So I, I guess, you know, instead of putting all the blame on Peter Navarro, I think maybe us as an economics profession should have been doing better all along that, yes. you know, journalists, economists, the BEA, um, I think in their press releases, they will, also, well, they will also say, you know, this has been a drag on, instead of saying that, we should just maybe look at, you know, GDP, you know, net of, of, of look at the growth of, of GDP and not get hung up on, you know, what imports and exports right. have done. And of course the irony is, David, uh, the faster the economy grows, the faster imports grow. There's yeah. a there's a, uh, a cause and effect both ways, right? As the economy expands, uh, both consumers and businesses import more. Um, but of course, the imports also fuel growth, uh, right? They they allow U.S. businesses to produce their final products uh, at a more competitive uh, price. And so, uh, I've done some analysis of this over the years, and there's a pretty strong relationship between the size of the trade deficit and the expansion of the U.S. economy. The faster the U.S. economy grows, the more we import, uh, and the bigger the trade deficit tends to be. The flip side is uh, 
the trade deficit will fall often sharply when we head into recession. Why? Foreign investment tends to dry up. Consumers uh, don't spend as much on domestic or imported goods. So they repeat this over and over again. I'm talking about the financial press and other people who don't understand it. And yet the plain facts uh, contradict it. Yeah. So there's, there's a cyclical component to this confusion, right? As the business cycle goes up and down, it affects it. And, and so it adds to this, this confusion. Well, let's move on. We, we've really, I think, kind of gone down into the depths of, of the uh, plumbing of the balance of trade. Let's talk about some of the critiques of trade that have been lobbied, uh, at, thrown at um, people like you and me and, and others uh, about the challenges it creates. So one of the critiques is look at the U.S. in historical perspective. We imposed trade barriers. We did trade protectionism to help us grow faster. Why can't other developing countries do the same thing? So what is, what is your response yeah, to that? And this is a historical argument. Uh, you, you hear Pat Buchanan and other people have said the U.S. had high trade barriers, and we were a protectionist country up until the 1920s and, and 1930s. And, of course, we expanded in breathtaking fashion in the late 1800s and became an industrialized power in the world. The problem with that narrative is that, and, and Douglas Irwin of Dartmouth has, has shown this and others, is that the, the sectors where we advanced most dramatically in the, 19, in the 1800s weren't the protected sectors. They were services and utilities and railroads and, and things like, like that. So it wasn't protectionism. It wasn't the protected sectors that were leading our growth. In fact, the, the uh, trade barriers tended to inhibit our growth because they made uh, some of the protected uh, commodities uh, more expensive for, for industry. And of course, uh, one thing the protectionists don't mention is during the, basically from the Civil War to World War I, we ran continuous trade deficits. Why? Kind of the same story as today, David. A lot of foreign investment coming into the United States, in particular, uh, British investors investing in American railroads and mines uh, and, uh, and, and industry. And then, of course, we had mass immigration <laughs> on a scale that's actually in proportion to our population uh, higher than it is uh, t today. So the Pat Buchanans of the world who, who cite protectionism as the, the key, one, the protectionism wasn't the decisive factor. That was also an era of large trade deficits and large-scale uh, immigration. Well, that's interesting. So uh, what you're saying is that our growth may have been even higher had these trade barriers not been in place because the economy is growing robustly anyways, these other sectors. But you, yes. you mentioned that the ones that were protected – may have clogged up some of, the, some of the economic activity. So maybe we could have done even better? Yeah, I think we would have done better, uh, yes. And again, Doug, Douglas Irwin's calculated that if you look at total factor productivity, uh -huh. ours was actually about the same as Great Britain's, which was free trade. So we didn't get any advantage okay. in sort of overall efficiency. We just grew faster because Britain's a little island. We're a continent, right, continental right. sized market. We had these huge infusions of labor of foreign labor and foreign capital really helped to make the United States the industrial okay. giant that it, that it became. And that's, I guess, what many of the, these critics, Pat Buchanan's and others who, who want to claim, hey, developing economies could follow the U.S. model. There's very unique circumstances to the U.S. that doesn't apply to these other places. Co co correct. And of course, uh, you know, you look around the world and those countries that have developed the fastest and achieve the highest incomes tend to be those that have, if not perfect free trade, at least uh, uh, more free trade and are more engaged in the global economy. Protectionism is a, a failed policy, whether you're a, a richer country or a poorer country. All right, let's move on to another critique. And, and, and this speaks to the winners and losers from trade. Yes. And, and everyone, including you and me, when I, when I would teach the class, we'd always say, look, Trade overall makes the country richer. The net welfare goes up. However, there will be losers. So, right. you know, textiles workers in the U.S. have lost out to other countries as those factories and those jobs got exported. But overall, we're a better, we're a richer country because of it. 
and 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 we economists have always been honest about this. I think that they've yes. always been clear about this. They never had any illusions. However, there's been some, a number of recent studies by um, David Otter, David Dorn, Gordon Hansen that made kind of a splash because they found that these effects, the, the loser effect, was actually larger than many economists had expected. And it was tied to China. China comes yes. into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, 2001. Big, big splash into the world economy. I mean, you're opening up a billion peop- over a billion people into the world economy. And so it's a huge shock. So what are your thoughts on that? What, what is it? What is it? What, the, what do these studies actually tell us, and, and how are they misinterpreted, and what should we yeah. take away? Yeah, that was the the China shock uh, paper that that has gotten a lot of a lot of comment. In some ways, there there wasn't anything new there. Just as you said, we've we've always known that. I mean, in some ways, it's the idea of trade, right? We we do less of what we're less competitive at, and more of what we're more competitive at. Mm-hmm. So when you open up an economy to trade, you're going to have some sectors that will shrink and they'll lay off their workers. Uh, That's nothing new. Uh, But also we know from theory and experience that the overall economy grows, it becomes more efficient and living standards rise uh, overall. And by the way, trade isn't the only disruptive force. Uh, You know, uh, millions of Americans are displaced from their job every year. Vast majority of them displaced not by trade, but by uh, technology, uh, changing consumer tastes. I was just reading uh, the other day, uh, Sears is probably going to go bankrupt, uh, not because of international competition, but uh, internal competition. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a refugee of the newspaper business, right? Right. 60% of daily newspaper jobs in America have disappeared in the last 20 years, not because of imports, because of technology. So in that sense, the the author paper is just pointing out something we all knew. And of course, uh, it's a, it's a monumental event really in human history that China has rejoined the global economy, right? Um, 1.3 billion people. So that was going to have some ripple effect. I think the, the Autor paper has been uh, kind of misused. Uh, and David Autor himself will say the last thing he has in mind is trade barriers against China. He, sa- he says he's in favor of free trade as the vast majority of economists are. I think a couple of ways their paper has been misunderstood. Um, They calculate just under a million manufacturing jobs uh, disappeared in the United States um, basically in over a decade, basically from the late 1990s uh, into the 2000s. That's a large number, um, but it is spread over a decade. So you're talking about 100,000 people a year displaced by imports. Uh, from from China. Well, David, that's that's half a month's uh, job creation I- in the United States. We have two or three hundred thousand people applying every week for unemployment insurance. So, in the in the vast churn of the labor market, that really isn't that big an amount. And as other economists pointed out, China's joining the world economy and the World Trade Organization was a one-time event. It, they're kind of settling into an equilibrium now. We're already mm-hmm. seeing China's growth and its export numbers uh, starting to level off. Uh, they're still growing, but as a share of the world economy and U.S. imports, it's starting to level off. So I think it would be a mistake. Yes, uh, real people lost their jobs. They weren't unique in that respect. During that same time period, we lost about 5 million manufacturing jobs overall. And uh, a study by Ball State University a year or two ago calculated more than 80% of those were because of technology, right? Automation. The reason, the, the main reason we've lost millions of manufacturing jobs over the last uh, couple of decades isn't because of trade. It's because of efficiency and automation. Our, our overall levels of output of manufacturing, real manufacturing output, manufacturing value added is at or near record highs. We're just doing it with fewer workers because they're so much more productive. Yeah, so you look at the 1 million number they come up with compared to the 5 million number that happened because of automation. So 1 million due to the China effect, 5 million due to automation. In some ways, this, this China shock may just be you know, hastening what was already going to happen because of yes. automation. So again, that's not to say we need 
not to be worried about the, these workers. It's still it's real loss, and we need to find ways to re-educate them, retool them, that, get that, them back in the labor that, market. That's the key and a subject for another show. Right, absolutely. But, but the right policy response is not to raise barriers to trade right. or to stop technological change, for that matter. It's to equip our fellow Americans, uh, particularly the younger generation, to fill the jobs being created today uh, and and tomorrow, not to somehow bring back the jobs of the past, which I don't think we can do anyway. So better education, particularly in the STEM subjects, um, more labor market flexibility, things like portable health uh, and retirement savings, all these things will help people adjust uh, to a changing economy. One of the things that's surprising about this is, is how the Trump administration has um, really pushed hard to get back these manufacturing jobs. In addition to bringing back, you know, what is now the global supply chain. So uh, there's a couple of comments. One, I don't think the Trump administration realizes how disruptive his policies would be to the global supply chain. And, yes. and it, would, it, it would adversely affect many places in the U.S. that are a part of that. So a car piece of a car gets made in China, then a piece yes. gets made in some small town in Mississippi, and it, these parts are shipped back and forth, and it's like a bo- throwing a bomb into that you know complicated global supply chain. Yes. The, uh, the other thing, though, that really is striking, um, and, and I, I guess I can forgive Trump and, and, and many people for not appreciating the global supply chain. It's, you have to really sit down and think hard about it. But one thing that he should know, that Peter Navarro should know, is that manufacturing jobs as, as a percent of the labor force have been declining? And I'm looking at a chart here since the 1940s. Yeah, constant. It's, it's it's almost like a linear. It's trend. like a straight line. You, you you know you couldn't find in that line when China joined the WTO when we signed NAFTA. Right. So I guess it's it's striking to me if if we've been losing jobs in manufacturing since the 1940s at a steady pace. Why do we think we can get them back? How? how I mean, surely Peter Navarro is aware of this trend. Um, maybe Trump isn't, but his his advisor yes. should be. <clears throat> I don't understand how they think we're going to get back manufacturing jobs that have been lost to robots, to machines. Yeah, we're 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 not. And you know uh, that chart we're we're looking at is true for every advanced economy. Germany, huh. China, China is losing millions of manufacturing jobs. They're going to lower cost places like Vietnam, and other places. It, we, we couldn't reverse it. Th- think what we'd have to do to our economy to get 10% of our population back into farming, right? right? It was 40% a century ago. Now it's 2%. What if somebody said, we were a great nation back when 10% of Americans were in farming? Uh, we'd, have to, we'd have to turn the economy upside down and, by the way, go back to a much lower standard of living. So, you know, we've actually been adding some manufacturing jobs as we become more uh, competitive in, in certain industries. But as a percentage of the workforce, every advanced economy, we, we can go macro in a mm-hmm. large scale here. Every advanced economies follow the same pattern, right? Farming jobs start dropping from the beginning. Uh, manufacturing tends to rise as a share of the population and then start to fall. Service jobs are always rising. The mark of an advanced economy is a rising share of the workers in the service sector where you can make a very good living. We have some very advanced uh, service sector jobs. It doesn't mean we don't farm. We, we graze record amounts of agricultural products with only 2% of the population being farmers because they're so productive. We're producing record amounts of manufacturing output with fewer factory workers because they're so much more productive. Isn't that the essence of economic advancement? On that positive note, we're going to have to end because we're out of time. Our guest today has been Dan Griswold. Dan, thank you for being on the show. David, it's been my pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.